Welcome to Seminar Sunday, District 21's weekly episodic webinar series. Thanks for joining us on this special edition on Father's Day 2019. It is June 16th, a great day to join us here for the Toastmasters International Annual Business Meeting Preview. I'm your host, Michael Bound, Program Quality Director with District 21. And through the next hour, we will be discussing some of the proposals, ideas, and of course, candidates that will be running for the Toastmasters International Board this August in Denver, Colorado. This is part of a weekly series of webinars that District 21 hosts. We only have two meetings left until the end of the program year. So next week we will be discussing goal setting and planning. And the following week we will be talking about how we are one year away from the deadline on the traditional program and whether you are on track to achieve the Distinguished Toastmaster designation by June 30th, 2020. So lots of good topics coming up besides this evening but it is great to have everyone on the line this week, and we hope that this will be insightful, a good chance to ask questions and find out exactly what this means for us as members and leaders here in District 21. What we're gonna talk about then is three things, really. We're gonna talk about what is this annual business meeting that I've referred to, how your club is able to have its vote count at the annual business meeting, which of course is very important. One thing to recognize is that the clubs are the members of Toastmasters International, and so the clubs are the, are the ones that hold the votes. And of course, we're gonna also do a quick overview of the candidates and the proposals that are being voted on this year. I encourage interaction through this, so if you've got questions, ideas, thoughts, don't hesitate to share them that will certainly add value to this conversation over the course of this hour together. So the annual business meeting, what is it? Well, first of all, because Toastmasters is a, is a great nonprofit organization that we are members of, or we're members of clubs, rather of Toastmasters International, each year we have an annual business meeting to vote on any changes to the governing documents. So those would be things like the policy and procedures, the club constitution, the uh, district administrator, administrative bylaws, etc. So there's a series of governing documents that you can find on toastmasters.org. If you go to Leadership Central and then on to governing documents, that is where you would locate all the governing documents that determine what our organization does in various situations. It's the rule of the law, so to speak. So that is one of the things that we determine every year at the annual business meeting. And of course, we also need leaders, such as our international president and the board of directors. We vote for various international level leaders each August at the convention. So between those two items, that is really the purpose of that meeting. The international president chairs the meeting, and uh, it's usually a relatively extensive meeting, but it's only one meeting a year. And this year it will be held Friday, August the 23rd, 2019, from 4.30 p.m. to 9 p.m., and that is Mountain Time, because of course it'll be held in Denver, Colorado, as part of the International Convention. So the International Convention, for those of you that have not had the privilege of attending, is a large show focused around a number of things. There's of course the International Speech Contest, which has the World Championship of Public Speaking. There's also the Accredited Speaker Program, the finals for that. So for those folks that are looking to get a professional speaking designation through Toastmasters International, they compete there. I guess it's not really competing, but they are scored and that determines whether or not they meet the criteria to become an accredited speaker. There are also lots of things to do with the candidates. So during the opening ceremonies, the, I believe it's the opening ceremonies, at least the candidates are paraded across the stage and introduced. There's booths set up to interview candidates or ask some questions and find out more about them. There's a full showcase about candidates. They get up and they speak for several minutes about some of the things that matter 
to the organization to get an idea of where the candidate lies, where, what are their beliefs in serving our organization. And uh, then the business meeting, of course, also takes a huge part of the convention. Besides that, lots of educational sessions, there's regional gatherings as well, and lots of other activities that uh, Golden Gavel as well is given out each year. Action packed Wednesday through Saturday, and usually the business meeting has historically been on the Saturday, but this year they've moved it to the Friday evening. So that's just some background information about what the business meeting is. Does anybody have any questions just about that, about the the, the premise of the business meeting or or things surrounding it? Was the was the change in date from Saturday to Friday because of the change in the uh, semifinals, the quarterfinal semifinals? Uh, that's a strong possibility. There's a, a number of things that have been shuffled around because, uh, of course, that is a, a cultural change. So to to give some further context to that, in the past, the, the Thursday has largely taken up most of uh, the day with semifinals because what would happen is we had uh, 10, I believe it was, yes, 10 semifinals throughout Thursday. And... Uh, we'd run them th th three or four at a time, three times during the day. So of course you've got like a morning, midday and evening. Most of the time you can't have anything concurrent because you know, with three contests happening, if people are gonna go to an activity, they're probably gonna go to one of the semifinals and watch those. That has been eliminated this year with the exception of having one semifinal. So I believe that is kind of a domino effect. Uh, the other challenge that we've had oftentimes is the business meeting does not always run on time. We've had uh, challenges, particularly thinking back to years like Washington DC in 2016, where um, there was a, a lot of issues with the, uh, with the machines in particular. So the votes weren't getting registered. Uh, instead of having a paper ballot, you register with a digital machine, which of course speeds things up when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of votes. So I do think that is a domino effect. Thanks for that question, John. So, so that is the business meeting. Now, how do we, uh, how are we involved? Well, there's a couple of ways that we get the privilege to vote. Uh, the most common way, of course, is through our member clubs. And note, I will call it member clubs because uh, going back to what I said right near the start is, um, is something that um, not everybody consciously thinks about. But if you ever ask somebody, are you a member of Toastmasters International? The correct answer to that individual is, is more than likely no, because the members of Toastmasters International are the clubs. They're the franchisees, you could call it. And members of the club are members of the club. They're not members of the international organization. So the voting privileges go to the clubs. Each club, I believe, carries two votes to the international convention. So uh, that is their entitlement to, to be represented as long as they're a club in good standing, of course. So if they've been, uh, if they're not in good, they haven't paid their dues or they're suspended, etc., they're not eligible to vote, but any active fully paid um, club is eligible to vote. There are other people that can vote and they carry a single vote and those are delegates at large. So that would be the full Toastmasters International Board, which comprises of the executive committee, and the executive committee would be your international president, the immediate past international president, international president-elect, second vice president, and first vice president. So that's the executive committee, those, those five roles. And all the international directors, which there's 14, one representing each region. The past international directors and presidents of past carry on their voting rights for the rest of uh, their time as either members of Toastmasters or uh, basically as long as they live, as long as there is uh, nothing that disqualifies them. And we won't get into that because it's, it's very unlikely that would happen. Governing documents, of course, does cover off those circumstances. District directors also are delegates at large and have one vote. And that is because district directors for the 116-ish districts we have around the world 
all are registered as officers of the international organization. So when you look at district officers, there is actually a distinct difference with the district director in that sense, as they are the only district officer that becomes registered with the international organization and therefore have that entitlement to vote. Again, it's one vote though for the district director. So here's the uh, the important thing though, because of course you uh, you know who has their votes. You, you know that the, the board and the past board members and the district directors all carry votes. Great, okay, that, that's easy peasy. But your club only gets a vote if you assign a proxy. What's important here, and this is different from a district, is the proxy that you assign is available to any member of Toastmasters, uh, Toastmasters Club that is, sorry. It is not like the district where it has to be a member of your club. So the difference is in a district council, the VP education and the president have the vote. They're the ones that carry votes to district council and can, can vote on business uh, at the district level. At the international level, the members of Toastmasters International are the ones that have the votes, which means the clubs. So the ability to assign a proxy for the international level is restricted to the president and secretary. Uh, if any other officer attempts to sign in and assign a proxy, they will not see this option whatsoever. If you are a president or a secretary or supporting your president or your secretary, this is what they need to do. They simply need to log in to the toastmasters.org website, navigate to Club Central, which is of course the same place they would go to submit an education award or update the club's information or pay member dues. So it's definitely somewhere that club officers should be pretty familiar with considering it's, it's the, uh, the main way to get all of that information in unless you are mailing things to world headquarters. From there, those two roles will see a club proxy assignment. Now that will not show up, of course, until at least July 1st, because it will be next year's officers that have that ability. I don't know how far into July, though. It may take a little bit longer before it actually becomes available. And uh, I will try to communicate that out as quickly as possible whenever I get wind that it's available. So those that uh, are keen to jump in and, and send it in have that uh, ability to go in and assign a proxy. Now I had some trouble finding a, a screenshot of what that looked like because I know it's changed a little bit over the last couple of years, the exact uh, user interface. For those of you that have been around a while, you'll actually notice if you log into Club Central, it looks very different than it did say five years ago or even two years ago for that matter. It's a little more of a, a user friendly interface, nicer looking, uh, same functionality for the most part, but the look is very different. There are three things you'll have here. So I've got a screenshot up right now of what it looks like. There is a sending a club delegate, which of course would be someone from your club that's going to vote on your club's behalf. Uh, so obviously the best choice if any member of your club happens to be attending. Um, great, great opportunity for them to go see what the business meeting is like, experience it, and really truly represent your club. They do need to be there in person though, so that is important that they are aware of their responsibility. Make sure you ask before uh, signing it to them that they're willing to attend because a lot of people, uh, historically more so a problem on the Saturdays would say, hey, I've got a flight out actually, can't make it. And it's unfortunate because you can't come up to, for example, myself in August and say, hey, I've got my machine to vote, but I'm actually not gonna be there. I can't take that. So it is really important that you talk to your club member first and let them know when it is. It's the Friday evening, <clears throat> 4.30 to 9 p.m. And if they're not committing 100%, then definitely look at the other two options. Another option is designating any active Toastmaster. So let's say you knew somebody in town that was going, um, then you, they can definitely hold uh, the vote as well. And uh, finally, there's the district director. And uh, what happens is there'll be either the district director or the next highest ranking officer, so program quality director, club growth director, in attendance, carries the votes. 
Uh, and that's typically what happens for a, a high percentage of the clubs because most clubs, of course, don't have somebody going and, and may not necessarily know somebody else that's going. Um, I don't know the exact percentage of how many go to the district director versus the um, another member over the years, um, but certainly uh, those are all options. And uh, what I will say as uh, the in incoming district director and what I've seen as um, program quality director and club growth director as well is um, there is a lot of homework done on the candidates by the, uh, the district leadership team. They all have interviews with the candidates and, uh, and usually do a little more research beyond that as well. And a caucus is held on site. And that's regardless if people have votes or not. It's a great time to discuss. Not only that, uh, but clubs can actually, uh, after you click on this, I don't have a screenshot of what it looks like after this, but let's say you picked any of them. You'll have the ability as well to put in who to vote for and how to vote for the proposals. If you put that in, then that means the person voting on your behalf must follow the direction you've given. So let's say, for example, you gave the direction to vote for candidate number three. No matter what happens, even if they fall on their face and they turn out to be you know, a terrible candidate from everybody else's opinion, we vote for candidate three. So what will likely happen in my place, uh, for example, is I'll have potentially a couple hundred votes and I may personally from the interviews and the research I've done think, you know what, this is probably the best candidate that's going to serve our organization the best. I'm going to vote, say, I don't know, let, let's pretend it's 200 votes I have and 20 have been assigned to the other person. I'm going to vote 180 for this person and 20 for the person that I don't necessarily support because that is the expectation of the person holding your proxy. So I want to make sure that's clear. It's, it's a good feature if you know for sure. The only thing I do caution is make sure you do your research on all of the candidates and the proposal and or whatever it is that you're uh, suggest or not suggesting your, your, um, uh, you're noting down to vote because that is not a, preference that is a you must vote this way and uh, I've seen that before I, I know Sean uh, you were in that position as well of course you've seen it where there's a certain number of votes that are designated to a certain person and uh, and that can become a little bit of a challenge because you may realize quickly that maybe they're not the best candidate for the role and there's nothing you can do about it you don't necessarily know if the club's done their research or whether they just you know how they came to the determination was that your experience? Uh, yes, it is. And the best, the only thing you can really do is you vote towards what the members directed you to, on, at least on the first ballot. Uh, the second ballot, everything's up for grabs. Yeah, that's another challenge as well, of course, is uh, if you had more than two candidates, if, if the candidate that a club has asked you to vote for drops out first, then it puts you in a little bit of an interesting predicament because you don't know what they wanted next which is the, the same thing really in terms of a lot of people. They decide how they're going to vote as their first preference, but then uh, you know, what do they do after that? Uh, it's, it's always, it, there was one year, I think that was Washington, D.C. as well, where we had five candidates for second vice presidents. You can imagine you know, everybody goes into that first round of voting knowing who they want to pick, uh, and then as soon as somebody gets eliminated, that gets tricky, and then, oh, their next favorite candidate gets el eliminated. Oh, we didn't discuss this. <laughs> Uh, that didn't happen to our team, but I know it happened to a lot of teams where they, uh, you know, they pick their favorites and uh, you don't necessarily go all the way down the line. So, and I don't think you have an option to pick more than one, uh, put an order to it. So I do see a couple of questions in the chat. Um, I saw one from uh, Sean, how do clubs become entitled to have their two votes? And I think I covered that, 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 that was, that wasn't me. I think that's Jan. Someone else. Oh. I got my name on mine, so someone else. Oh, okay. Sorry, there's a lot of District 21 Toastmasters. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, uh, so they uh, are entitled to their votes by having uh, their club in good standing. That's the only requirement, um, as far as I know anyways, that the club has to be in good standing. 
Um, so if it's for any reason out of good standing, whether that's for membership payments or some sort of serious violation, um, they will not have the ability to carry their votes. And Jim has also asked, can only the president do the club proxy assignment? No, it is the president or the secretary that can do it, but only those two. So somebody that's VP education or any of the other roles will not be able to even see the option where they would go in to click on the uh, the club proxy assignment. So it's important to, to note that because um, I've, I've seen that happen before too, where you know, club president says, hey, you know, VP education, do you think you could submit this for me? Uh, no, they, they literally can't. <laughs> Unless, unless you share logins, which is probably not a good idea. So that is, uh, that's how you ensure your club is registered to vote uh, through any of those channels. And uh, hopefully that's a, that's a real nice thing for you to consider as well, that you can actually uh, tell whoever you're sending to vote how to vote. If you really feel strongly about, you know, whether it be one candidate or all candidates, you have that ability. Uh, just keep that that power that you have in mind that uh, if uh, the the team finds uh, that for whatever reason they think that really this candidate is ooh you know they really said some weird things in the interview, we still vote for that person based on your direction. So very good if you feel comfortable in the decision. Uh, if you're kind of not sure, you're just like oh well I want to help them out and, and give them some ideas who to vote for. It, it's not an idea. It's a it's a direction that you're giving to the uh, either the, the member of your club, the active Toastmaster member, or the district director. So let's start with the elections for the board. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to provide a lot of context. I'll give you a little bit of information about who's who in the zoo, so to speak. But uh, in terms of the individuals, I'm not going to speak very much on because, of course, um, that would not be uh, that would not be fair. We we need to be fair and objective. I believe that all the candidates um, have great skill sets, and uh, you know I'm always so impressed with the caliber of leaders that we see on our board of directors. And um, yeah, I think we win no matter what. It's it's incredible, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a moment. So uh, this is not really elections, but just to kind of go through those executive committee positions that that uh, are out there and uh, they've went through the process of getting elected and now they're kind of in their, their final years on the board. So Lark Doley, who's our current international president, will move into the immediate past international president role at the international convention on the Saturday, the day after the business meeting. And... Uh, that is her final year on the board uh, of Toastmasters International, and then she becomes a free agent and, and does whatever uh, she wishes to do within the organization. So that is our, our Lark Doley, current international president. As she moves out, Deepak Menon of New Delhi, India, will move in as the new international president. Again, that will be the same time uh, on the Saturday. Uh, Saturday evening, they usually run a kind of a formal inauguration and then they have a celebration to celebrate the new president on Saturday night that involves dinner, dancing, etc. Now, the, the interesting thing about the international president-elect candidate is there is only one. And in order to qualify for this role, uh, you essentially need to serve in the position prior. So it's, it's actually uh, funny that uh, we have elections for this, but we do. Um, there's a couple of positions like this. International presence elect is one of them. So at this very moment, Richard Peck of Seymour, Connecticut is our first vice president of the international organization. He will stand for the international president elect position and, and, uh, and then move forward from there, of course, to the president and immediate past international president. The next person would be the first vice president candidate, and that is Margaret Page of Delta, British Columbia, Canada. So she is currently second vice president. She, uh, she won out of, I believe it was three candidates, uh, three nominated candidates and two floor candidates, I want to say, last year. And um, so now basically because she's got into that second vice president position again to qualify for first vice president you essentially have to serve as second vice president uh, for the most part so 
it's almost always, in fact, I've never seen it with more than one candidate uh, to move forward. And Margaret Page, of course, happens to also be a member of our District 21, as well as our friends to the north in District 96. She's in two of our clubs here in, in uh, District 21, one in Tawasson and one in Richmond. There are three nominated candidates for second vice president. I'm not aware right now of anyone running from the floor. Uh, it is possible to run from the floor as well. You must have served as an international director in order to qualify to run for second vice president. Uh, but in order to run for, from the floor, you also need to have went through the International Leadership Committee. That's a new rule as of the last couple of years. So in this case, uh, if you decided that, you know what, I want to be international second vice president, you can't just stand up in the business meeting and nominate yourself or get somebody to nominate you. You have to have went through a process, been declined, or in this case for these three individuals, accepted. And then you can, you can run for the position in either case. That being said, being a nominated candidate means a lot um, for the international organization because as you can see, we have three people here that are very well, well qualified for the role. And because they've been nominated, it makes it very challenging to compete against them if you were running from the floor because the International Leadership Committee, made up of past international directors and past international presidents, really, you know, they, they've done their homework. They've spent hours and hours and hours researching these individuals before determining who the suitable candidates are. I have thus far had a chance to talk to both Matt Kinsey and Russell Drake on the phone just last week. Uh, hopefully talk to Magnus sometime soon as well. Uh, three incredible gentlemen I have so much respect for. And, uh, you know, both the, the, the individuals I've spoken to already are very much complementary of each other as well. I mean, I remember Russell saying to me, you know, me, Matt, and Magnus, we're buddies. You know? <laughs> and I thought that was so cool that, you know, even though they're running for such such a high profile position in the organization that will lead them to international president. They're, they're friendly about it and not um, fighting. It's, it's very different than traditional U S politics. If you watch that. And like Sean didn't even laugh or anything at that one. Gee. Well, I did, but I was on mute. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so true though. I, I remember uh, we had a, a contestant as well competing at the international semifinals and uh, she just couldn't believe the team spirit there of the con contestants competing against her that were actually running around this room that they were going to compete in listening to all the different speakers to make sure she sounded good in all of them so sportsmanship is uh, is a big part of toastmasters and um, just so happy to see that at that level because uh, you know, it's it's not every organization you would see that in for sure. And U.S. politics, definitely not. So that is the uh, second vice president candidates. Now, I'm going to bring up a list of all the candidates for international director here as well and uh, pictures of them. And you will notice numbers on each side. That is the region that they would represent. An important thing here to understand is that an international director does not actually just serve that region. Sometimes you'll see that somebody's uh, labeled them international director, region three. The real title is actually just international director. They serve the world on the board and they're all equal in that aspect, all 14, 14 of them. They represent a region that they come from. So it's important, of course, in a global organization like ours to have people from different parts of the world to give that true global organization viewpoint rather than, you know, everybody from the same city or same club. Uh, that would definitely not be a global view. That would be a, a, an individual club's view on how things should be led. So that's what the numbers represent. They don't represent that that person only serves on the board in that region. It means that they are on the board for the whole world and they just happen to be representing that region. So every year be, to keep things um, fair, I guess you could say, and, and have some, um, keep, keep the elections relatively short, um, have some continuation each year, they only replace half the board. 
every year. So board members serve for two years before they, they leave the board. Uh, what happens, of course, is your first year, you're kind of a junior member of the board, and then the second year, you're more of a senior member of the board. And um, this year, we're electing the odd number regions. You'll see all those numbers are odd numbers. Next year, we go back to even numbers, et cetera, back and forth each year. So uh, region one is, is this year, which is our region. District 21 is, is home to region one. Uh, region three is down in the central area of the U.S. I'm thinking Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, I believe it's part of Texas. Region five is also part of Texas. and can't remember exactly where else. Region seven is uh, kind of towards some of the southern states, uh, the Carolinas, for example. Region nine is up more towards the New York area. Uh, region 11 is Europe, and Region 13 is Southern Asia area. So um, uh, both those candidates, in fact, happen to be from India. So India is definitely a big part of Region 13. So those are the candidates uh, for the uh, for the board. We have uh, um, usually two per uh, person. That has been narrowed down in many cases. Just thinking in, in our region, for example, there was four people that put their name forward for the board. The International Leadership Committee squeezed that down to two. And now, you know, in our case, we have two very qualified candidates. We have Karen Knight from District 21 and Naomi Takushi from District 57 down in California. So uh, both of them will go to the International Convention. They will meet with, can uh, with potential uh, votees, I guess you can call them, and um, those individuals will decide, you know, out of the two, who's the better person, and they will they will vote for them, and then, of course, uh, one of them will su succeed to the board, and, and the other one, I'm sure, will uh, be behind the scenes supporting. So that's, once again, the great thing about the organization is no matter what happens, it's typically um, the way things have went. Another quick side note on the international directors is um, a number of them have served as region advisors as well. Uh, that is not necessarily a, a benefit per se. Um, some people believe that, hey, you know, that's what you should do is maybe you should be a region advisor first. The region advisor program itself was actually created to um, open up a position for those that maybe aren't necessarily suitable for the board. So what happened in the past is board members would do both. They would support with the operational side and help district leaders serve uh, their, their clubs and members. And they would also, of course, do the strategic planning, be an ambassador for the organization. But they split it apart, and I think this was about 2010, I want to say. And the, the region advisor was more for those that are better at operational instead of strategic. Uh, so you would go and just support districts, help build and clubs, those types of things. The international director remains as an ambassador for the organization and, of course, a person at the table when it comes to discussions on policy, governing documents, etc. So that is kind of the change that's happened over the years. Uh, but the intention was not that you know, being a region advisor would be a, a, a stepping stone, so to speak, to becoming an international director. So I, I just wanted to highlight that because there's a couple of people here that have been region advisors uh, on there. I'm not going to name them because, uh, you know, I, I certainly don't want to make it sound like they, um, you shouldn't vote for them because they could be the best candidate for sure, no doubt about it. But, but uh, that in itself does not necessarily mean that they are a better candidate. Um, so we'll certainly, I, I know, for example, myself, when I go to Denver, uh, I'll treat every candidate exactly equal. And, uh, you know, of course, I'll come in with some ideas based on phone calls with, with many of them. But um, I won't have my mind 100% made up until after the showcase when, you know, it's kind of getting close to the business meeting. So that is the candidates for the various roles. Is there any questions at all about... Um, how that works or candidates or anything along those lines change to the term board members and you've actually heard me uh, use this term uh, a fair bit during this call board members uh, in the bylaws of toastmasters international it it still refers to director uh, and that's in relation to of course anybody that's on the board 
But again, there is a difference. The, there's international officers, and that is, you know, those top five, the international president, the vice president, the president-elect, and the immediate past international president. Then there are the directors, those 14 individuals that are directors. So if you're talking about all of them, then the umbrella term board members is is more appropriate to use rather than director because, you know, calling director refer suggests that maybe you're talking just about the international directors rather than the whole board, including the international president and other officers. So just clarification on that using board members over just a director. Any question? Okay. The uh, next proposal, F, introduction of the term charged member. So a charged member uh, does not mean in, in terms, it's not in reference to being pay, paying for something, it's uh, charged in some sort of uh, violation of a provision of the Toastmasters International governing documents. So somebody that's been uh, charged with something uh, is just outlined separately uh, as a different term. So of course, right now you've got, um, the different definitions, you know, paid member in good standing, active, inactive, honorary, as you see on the screen there. Uh, this would be just another category of somebody, you know, if, uh, if they've been accused of some sort of violation um, that perhaps has been referred to the disciplinary committee. Any questions on that? I'm just hoping that none of us ever become charged members. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. <laughs> you have to figure because I don't think it would look good on your resume having it down there. Yeah, I'm a charged member. Yeah, no, paid member is a good thing. Charged member is not. <laughs> Active is even is good too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, proposal G is the definition of the term active membership. So uh, <laughs> very that flows into that nicely. So uh, individual uh, membership, of course, has those different categories. And basically, they just want a definition for what is an active member. If you go and read through the governing documents now, you'll see it talk about what an inactive member is, what an honorary member is, um, a whole bunch of other things. But it doesn't cover uh, explicitly more about what it means to be an active member. So they're just going to add that in a uh, definition of that term. H. We're getting there, by the way. If anybody's thinking, boy, there's a lot of proposals, this is an unusually high amount of proposals. Uh, there's just, Some years there's one or two. Uh, this year they have apparently been just spitting them out. But as you can see, for the most part, they're not major changes. A lot of them are just little tweaks here and there to clean up some of the terminology. Um, there's some that could certainly be a little bit bigger, but um, they're definitely not earth-shattering to the point the whole organization changes. Uh, in this H here, the international dues and fees versus club dues and fees. So this is uh, getting into uh, more about our obligation to, to pay dues to international and the difference between what club dues are and international dues. So it's, of course, um, helping to make it more clear what those three really are. You know, the Toastmasters dues which encompasses everything, club dues, and then club new member fees, because some clubs, of course, charge new member fees above and beyond what Toastmasters International charges. Uh, specifically, uh, they're going to uh, change the title of Article 3, and they're going to introduce a paragraph that indicates where in the governing documents the Toastmasters International dues and fees are defined and described, and I believe they're going to reorder things a bit as well to make more sense uh, when you're reading it from, you know, Toastmasters and clubs dues uh, and the differences between the two. Any questions about that? Okay. Proposal I, outdated materials and committee designation. This, this one I actually found quite interesting when, when researching it a bit. Um, so they're trying to remove references to outdated materials um, that no longer align with the current practices of Toastmasters International. Um, so uh, things like, you know, it's got in the next bullet there, the new member kit uh, doesn't get sent out anymore. So removing that from the um, governing documents is what they're looking at, as well as renaming the club nominating committee to the club leadership committee, which is now brought into line with the district leadership committee and international leadership committee. Um, so same 
function, just different levels of the organization. They changed the uh, International Nominating Committee to International Leadership Committee quite a long time ago, I believe, and District Leadership Committee followed just a couple of years ago. So it's just aligning them all. That's really the, the major changes there. Jay, uh, club management of individual memberships. So of course, as everybody knows, club members need to submit membership, uh, sorry, prospective members rather, need to submit a membership application, club votes on it, you decide to accept the member, send the application and fees to World Headquarters, done. Uh, currently it says club secretary is supposed to do that. Um, but of course, in practice, it's prob I suspect most clubs don't actually have their club secretary do it. I know in clubs I've been involved with, it's e either been the treasurer or VP membership typically, who's taking care of all that, you know, submitting, uh, getting the member registered online and everything. So the board is proposing changing it to, uh, this is the club constitution being changed, to uh, allow a membership application to be filed with, uh, or sorry, by any club officer. So in other words, uh, if you are the VP membership, this would now um, make it, I guess you could say, quote unquote, legal. Uh, right now, it's kind of a, a thing that's done, and I'm sure most people don't realize it's currently not. It, it's in the bylaws that it's supposed to be the secretary, uh, but just changing it, cleaning that up. Any questions about that? Just a comment. I think it's about time, but one of the things I, another concern I have is that for those clubs that have their own customized constitution or bylaws, uh, this, I'm just wondering... How is this going to affect it? Won't they have to um, amend their own if they want to keep it in line? So uh, what do you mean they have their own? The clubs were allowed to have their own bylaws, and they were supposed to follow the model, but they could modify them if they, to, to, to the they have. Are you, are you referring to the, uh, the sections that you can amend on Club Central? I guess that's it. Maybe that's it. So that won't affect this. And this will, this will be another area that they can't amend. They will mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now, this is currently an area that's not amendable and uh, it will remain not amendable that just any club officer can do it. And we'll go on to K. Uh, speech contests. This is a, an interesting one. Uh, basically right now it only says that inactive members of your club uh, can't participate in the international speech contest, but they're just saying that all speech contests, if the member is inactive. Uh, inactive is used very, uh, in the clubs I've been part of, is used very loosely though. I don't know if any of you are part of a club that has a strict inactive member policy. The silence is suggesting you don't. I am not. It is an area, that is an area you can amend on Club Central, actually the definition of inactive member and Supposedly you can have inactive member dues and things like that. If they're not active, I suspect they'll not be willing to pay extra dues. But anyways, <laughs> I guess it's a way to help people move on if, uh, if they're not active and contributing to the club. So that is um, uh, just a small modification there in that sense. And then L, I believe this is the final proposal actually. We made it all the way to the final proposal. Um, so there's just several structural concerns that they're looking at for the three levels, corporate, in, international, and district. Uh, so, for example, if you look at board meeting minutes, you'll see often that it's the secretary treasurer signing off on it. Uh, but in reality, the secretary and treasurer roles, quote unquote, is taken by different people, uh, different employees in world headquarters. So what's interesting is the organization is much like a club in they, they do appoint somebody to be their secretary treasurer. Currently they do not, uh, it's not somebody that's hired just to be the secretary treasurer. Uh, a good example is um, a number of years ago, uh, the secretary treasurer was uh, our chief operating officer at the time, Sally Noel Cohen. Um, so she is certainly not a, you know, that, that's not her role to be secretary treasurer of Toastmasters International. It's just for the board, that's the role she took on. So uh, because it's different employees that are actually effectively serving in, in kind of the finance and secretarial support, 
they've decided to separate it to secretary and treasurer components. Recognize that, that different work. Um, and then international, <clears throat> I just talks about um, cleaning up, I believe, the qualifications and term limitations of individuals elected to the board. So just making sure that, that is super clear. Uh, district. Uh, right now, and this is something that some people may not even realize, districts can operate without divisions. So you could have just area directors reporting to the um, district team uh, and have no divisions. That is something that they're looking at changing because no districts for many, many years have decided to exercise the right to operate without a division. So they're basically just taking that out of the, the bylaws then and divisions will be a continued structure, required structure because of how integral they are part of the district structure. And speaking from somebody with a couple of years here of, of district leadership experience, I can't believe how challenging, how cha I can't imagine rather, how challenging that would be to operate without division directors. That would be so, so difficult to have, you know, 30 odd uh, area directors working directly with you and, uh, and, and making sure they have the support that they need to be successful. So um, that's just my perspective. Especially if they're odd. Odd? Well, you said 30 odd, so yes. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, well they could be. <laughs> Thanks for that. Any questions about this one? All right. Well, I, uh, I apologize for keeping just a couple minutes late here, but I want to thank everybody for your participation, uh, listening in on this session, and hope that you've taken some nuggets out of this and look forward to hopefully seeing you at that business meeting. But if I don't, then uh, make sure you get those proxies assigned. And if you have any questions or thoughts, uh, feel free to reach out. Always happy to uh, provide some insight. And, uh, of course, don't hesitate to provide those um, those directions on how to vote for various candidates as long as, uh, as they're well researched. And with that, I will say good night, everyone.